right after World War II, a 6 kg sphere of plutonium-239 was quietly melted down and then repurposed for the US nuclear stockpile. Once intended for deployment over Japan, this core was never detonated, but it had already proven to be deadly. Before its destruction, this metallic sphere had caused the deaths of two prominent physicists. This is the tragic story of what became known as the Demon Core, a name earned not through war, but through a scientific accident. To comprehend the danger, we must begin with the nature of the core itself. Both uranium and plutonium, especially the isotopes uranium-235 and plutonium-239, are capable of undergoing nuclear fission. This process releases extraordinary amounts of energy, which can be harnessed in power plants or unleashed in weapons of mass destruction. In weapons like Little Boy and Fat Man, Droplin Hiroshima and Nagasaki, these materials were held in a subcritical state. They were only brought to criticality when conventional explosives compressed them into a denser mass, triggering a self-sustaining chain reaction. Radiation from these materials is naturally emitted in the form of neutrons. On their own, they are dangerous but decently manageable. However, if reflected or concentrated, even a small amount of fissile material can become critical without any explosives required. One physicist, Richard Feynman, described these experiments as tickling with the tail of a sleeping dragon. Another one, Enrico Fermi, warned bluntly, keep doing that experiment that way and you'll be dead within a year. His prediction would end up coming true. We will give a quick and simple explanation so we can understand what happened here with the demon core. Each one of us is made up of billions upon billions of atoms. Atoms are found throughout the universe, but not in the same quantities. These elements, plutonium and uranium, are heavy enough that when fission occurs, that is, when the nucleus splits into two or more parts, massive amounts of energy are released. The fission of these elements happens today in nuclear power plants in a very safe and efficient way, making nuclear energy one of the cleanest and most efficient forms of energy. These two materials, plutonium and uranium, naturally release neutrons during the process of nuclear breakdown. And as we mentioned, if there is enough nuclear stuff around, those neutrons can set off a chain reaction since they bump into the centers of other atoms and cause more and more neutrons to be released, creating huge amounts of energy. But there is also another way for criticality to happen without needing traditional explosives to squeeze the core. It turns out that if you place a very heavy material around it to bounce the neutrons back in, something that stops them from escaping and sends them inward again, like a mirror would, a chain reaction can start with much less plutonium or uranium, even though a full explosion wouldn't happen when a criticality is reached, a deadly blast of radiation still could, and that is exactly what happened with the Demon Core. After Japan's surrender, the third nuclear core manufactured during World War II no longer had an immediate wartime use. Scientists at Los Alamos took this opportunity to study its behavior under near-critical conditions. Otto Robert Frisk was assigned to investigate neutron multiplication in uranium and plutonium. The goal was to better understand criticality thresholds, how close the core could get to a self-sustaining reaction without actually detonating. These experiments were cutting-edge at the time and very risky. On the night of August 21st, 1945, physicist Harry K. Daglian Jr. was working alone in the lab, positioning heavy tungsten carbide bricks around the core. His goal was to determine how many bricks and in what arrangement would reflect enough neutrons to push the core to criticality. Earlier that day, his instruments showed the reaction was approaching dangerous levels of radiation. He made the choice to halt the experiment, but later that same night, he returned, driven by curiosity. When he got to the lab, he started placing the bricks the same way he had done earlier that same day. While he was placing one of the last bricks, the radiation reader warned him that if he placed another one, the core would become critical 
So as he placed another brick, this one slid from his hand and fell onto the assembly. The system went instantly critical. A flash of blue light and a weight of heat erupted in the lab. Harry instinctively knocked off the brick with his hand, but it was too late. The damage was already done. He had absorbed a lethal dose of radiation in mere seconds, the highest ever recorded at the time. Daglian died 25 days later, on September the 15th, from acute radiation syndrome. He was just 24 years old. A nearby security guard, Robert J. Hammerley, also received a significant dose of radiation. He survived, but died decades later from leukemia, now believed to be radiation-induced leukemia. Seven months later, another physicist, Louis Slotkin, was leading a demonstration using the same plutonium core. It was May 21st, 1946. Unlike Daglian, Slotin used two beryllium hemispheres to encase the core. The goal was to bring them as close together as possible without triggering criticality. Slotin had conducted this dragon tail experiment many times, using only a flathead screwdriver to separate the hemispheres. He ignored safer methods and built-in safety measurements that would prevent these two beryllium spheres to completely shut. To compensate for this, he would use his bare hand and lower the upper hemisphere, while with the other hand, he would hold a flathead screwdriver between the two hemispheres. Slotin was already experienced at this, and he had done this several times. The afternoon of the accident, Slotin was doing the same experiment with many colleges in the room, but this unfortunate time, as eight colleges observed, the screwdriver slipped, the hemisphere snapped shut. Again, the room was flooded with a burst of blue light and searing heat. The core had gone super critical. Slotin shouted for everyone to freeze while they were running. He handed out chalk and told the other scientists to mark their exact positions. With those notes, he could calculate each person's radiation exposure and, indirectly, how much time had been taken off of their lives. Slotin, closest to the core, received over a thousand rats, perhaps the most concentrated dose of radiation ever survived, even for a short time. He died nine days later, on May 30 in the same hospital where Daglian had passed away, under the care of the same nurse. Both accidents produce a brief but vivid Sharenkov glow, a flash of blue light caused when high-energy particles move faster than the speed of light through air. These particles excite air molecules which emit blue photons, as they calm. While gases can absorb and re-emit this energy, the human body cannot. Gamma rays and neutrons pass through flesh and bone, stripping electrons from molecules, damaging DNA and destroying cells on a molecular level. This cascade of damage leads to acute radiation poisoning, or ARS, which then leads to vomiting and diarrhea, blisters, inflammation, impaired cognition, multi-organ failure, confusion, nausea, high fever, dizziness. Since 1945, over 60 such criticality accidents have occurred worldwide, killing at least 21 scientists and workers at the facilities around the world. Ironically, the Demon Core was never used in war. It was scheduled for a nuclear test detonation in July 1946, but following Slotin's death, the plan changed. Instead, on July 1st, a different core was detonated in a 23 kiloton explosion near Bikini Atoll. The Demon Core was still intact. It was melted down and distributed throughout the American nuclear stockpile. This silent killer of a sphere was disassembled without even a sound. <laughs>